Hi everyone, this is Hao Tesaki. This webinar is based on the presentation that I gave in a very recent international conference, and which was an on-site conference, and I was there, as you see. And this is the title of this conference, and so it was held to celebrate the 90th birthday of Professor Elliot Leap. And it was held in Harvard, very nice place, tourist here. And, Okay, so this is myself and Elliot Leap. Okay, anyway, let's get started. So the title of this webinar is Variations on a Theme by Leap, Schultz, and Mattis. Okay, and this is the paper in which this main theme was introduced. It's a very famous 1961 paper, but our main theme was introduced only in Appendix B of this paper in the proof of theorem two. And this innocently looking unitary operator, this is our main theme. And here's the table of contents. So after introducing this twist operator, which is the main theme, I discuss these variations based on the twist operator. Okay, let me start from basic setting. So <clears throat> I will treat quantum spin system defined on the infinite chain, I denote by Z, okay? And I think some of you are not familiar with the treatment of infinite spin system, but I think this explanation will be enough. But if you want to know, if you want to know more details, uh, I recommend you to read either my book or this review article. I think both are readable. Okay, <clears throat> anyway, so let's get Let's continue. So um, as usual, I denote by J the site of infinite chain. And on each site, I have quantum spin with spin quantum number S. And in most part of this talk, I consider spin one system, but for the moment, let's say that S is, S, S takes general value, one half, one, three halves, dot, dot, dot. And this is just the usual notation, uh, spin operator, x component, y component, z component, and they satisfy this familiar commutation relation. And yes, sz squared is equal to this s times s plus one. This is a constant. And they act on this Hilbert space. And probably this is new to some of you. By r log, I denote the set of all polynomials of these spin operators. In other words, our lock is the set of all local operators of this spin system. And you don't have to care about this, but the C star algebra R of this quantum spin system is the completion with respect to this, the operator norm of this R lock. Okay. Then in this treatment of infinite system, our state of quantum spin system is a linear function row from this space of uh, operators to the, set, the set of complex number, and which satisfies this normalization condition and this positivity condition, where A is any, any operator. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, in usual language, rho of A denotes the expectation value in our quantum state of this uh, operator A. Okay. So you, if you see this kind of thing, uh, you always interpret this as a, as a quantum mechanical uh, expectation value. Okay, let me talk about Hamiltonian. Uh, so this is usual expression, but this is a formal expression because this is an infinite sum. So uh, the basic object is this Hj, which is I call local Hamiltonian, which is an element of R lock. And I assume that it's short ranged, it, I mean, there are there is a constant R node and HJ acts on this finite portion of the chain. And I also assume that HJ is translation invariant in the sense that HJ is obtained by translating this Hamiltonian H node. And actually in many theorems that I prove here, I do not assume translation invariance, but, uh, uh, but I make this assumption for simplicity in this talk. Okay, and this is an essential assumption. I assume that Hj is invariant, Hj is U1 invariant, in the sense that Hj is invariant under any uniform rotation about the z-axis. Uh, this is the equation. Uh, so this is a rotation operator about z-axis. Okay. And I say it's invariant. And this is, as I said, an essential assumption. And there are many spin quantum spin systems which are not 
U1 invariant. So this is an essential assumption for us. A typical example satisfying all of this is the Heisenberg antiferromagnetic chain with this local Hamiltonian. Okay, now I define unique gap ground state. <coughs> uh, in this treatment of infinite spin system, a state omega is said to be a ground state. I always abbreviate ground state as GS, uh, if and only if this inequality is satisfied for any local operator V. Okay, what does this mean? Uh, this, this uh, in short, means that you cannot lower the energy of the state omega by a local modification with the operator V. Well, to see this, uh, consider usual finite quantum spin system, quantum system, and suppose that this omega A is given in this usual form. This phi ground state is uh, normalized ground state cat. And then uh, if you work a little bit, you find that this inequality here precisely becomes this inequality here. Then this is of course the very familiar and standard variational characterization of a ground state. Okay. So uh, oh, yes, so this is the energy ex expectation value in this state phi, phi ground state. And it says that it's, it, it's not lower than the ground state. So this says that if this is true for any V, it means that phi ground state is a ground state. And so this is an infinite volume version of this variational characterization. And actually, I want to note that, uh, as I said, this H is a formal infinite sum. And so it does not belong to R log or anything. But this commutator HV is well-defined because V is a local operator. So this V dagger HV, this, this operator here is an element of R log. It's a local operator. So this is a very well-defined condition. Okay, so <clears throat> now here's a definition of unique gap ground state. A ground state omega is said to be a unique gap ground state, or more precisely, a unique ground state accompanied by non-zero energy gap, if and only if it is, first of all, the only ground state in this sense, and also there exists a positive constant gamma, and this inequality is valid for any local V uh, with this condition, omega V equals zero. And the energy gap delta E is the largest such constant gamma, okay? And again, uh, this is this reduces to the standard definition uh, if you consider this uh, ground state for a finite quantum system. And in this case, uh, this inequality becomes this. And so, and this condition becomes this. So this, the second condition means that V phi ground state is orthogonal to the ground state. And this first condition means that its energy expectation value is larger than, not smaller than E ground state plus gamma. So you see that this is again, the standard variational characterization of a unique gap ground state. The picture is like this. <clears throat> now I can introduce the main themes, which is the twist operator. Hey, such an operator was probably first introduced by Bloch and then Liebschutz and Mattis. But here I discussed a version introduced by Affleck Lieb, which is a local twist operator. Okay. And uh, I take real X and positive L, and this is a definition. So this is basically the rotation operator about the Z axis, but this rotation angle theta J depends on site. So this is a equation, but uh, it's e probably easier to see this one here. So the rotation angle is zero and starts increasing linearly and reaches two pi. And of course, two pi rotation is the same as zero rotation and it stays there. Okay. So it acts non-trivially only on this finite portion of the chain. And this is a basic lemma due to Leap, Schultz, and Mattis. And uh, you take any x and sufficiently large l. Then uh, this inequality for this expectation value, value is valid. Uh, this expectation value is bounded from above by C over L, where C is a constant. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> how do you use this? Well, first of all, suppose that this expectation value omega u is zero. Then if you recall this definition of a of gapped ground state, uh, this inequality and this implies that the energy gap of omega is uh, bounded from above by C over L. And so 
since L can be made as large as possible, uh, large as you want, uh, this indicates that the ground state omega is gapless, either gapless or degenerate. And actually this was the logic originally used by Leap, Schultz, and Mattis, and Affleck Leap to prove their theorems. But here I want to sort of revert this uh, logic and first uh, assume that omega is a unique gap ground state with energy gap delta E. I want to start from this assumption. Then you see that this, in, this identity cannot be valid uh, because this will show that uh, this omega is gapless. So you see that this is non-zero, but not, not only that, uh, an easy computation shows that you can show this inequality here. So this means that when L is sufficiently large, this is almost one. So this means that this expectation value, the absolute value of this expectation value is almost one. So here's the plot of ex this expectation value omega u. So it takes a complex value, but <clears throat> under this condition, uh, this expectation value can take value only in this ring shaped region. So here's one, okay. Uh, it, it lives only in this ring shaped region. This is very essential for us. Okay, so I now move on to variations. And the first, uh, I first discussed generalized leap schultz mattis theorem. For this purpose, I need to make a small modification to the twist operator, but it's it's almost a trivial modification. I multiply this u by this, this constant factor. And then by using this identity, uh, you can rewrite this u tilde like this, this one. Why did I do this? Because uh, now you see that this u tilde xl is continuous both in x and l. Okay, and this continuity is necessary for us. And actually, I also note that this modification is necessary only when s is a half on integer. If s is an integer, then this original uxl itself is continuous both in x and l. Okay. Anyway, uh, <coughs> with this modification, now I suppose that omega is a unique gapped ground state. And then since Hamiltonian needs translation invariant, omega is also, trans of course, translation invariant, and you have this identity here. And you also know that this omega u tilde is continuous in x, okay? And I fix L for to be sufficiently large, and then this is, of course, very close to one, okay? Now, this lives in this ring-shaped region, and if you change x from zero to one, then it forms, it, it defines a loop within this ring-shaped region, okay? And then, of course, you have a well-defined winding number associated with this loop. And in this case, the winding number is two, okay? So I denote this winding by number by nu omega. And this is an example of a topological index in the sense that it's invariant under continuous modification of unique gap ground states. And we further, we can further show that this winding number is exactly equal to this expectation value here simply the expectation value of SZ operator plus S, and this is known as the filling factor. And this is a quick derivation. First, this is the relation you can easily find from the definition. And then you want to take the expectation, ground state expectation value of this in this identity. And now left-hand side is simply this. And as for the right-hand side, you use the freshman trick and take the expectation value of here and here separately to get this. And of course you need a justification. And in this case, if, if L is sufficiently large, you can justify this. And then uh, X, uh, this X, X dependence appears only in this exponential factor. And you easily find that the winding number is given by this. Okay, what do we learn from this? Well, so we learned that for quantum spin chain with a short range U1 invariant translation invariant Hamiltonian, uh, when omega is a unique gap ground state, then this omega, this expectation value, the filling factor is equal to the winding number and must be an integer. Okay, I take the contraposition of this statement and get this uh, theorem due to Oshikawa, Yamanaka, and Affleck. This was for finite chain and I did the infinite chain version. And it says that when this expectation value is not an integer, this omega cannot be a unique gap ground state. 
And this is an example of Lipschitz Mattis type theorem. In general, by a Lipschitz Mattis type theorem, I, I mean a no-go theorem that states that a certain quantum many body system cannot have a unique gap ground set. It's a no-go theorem. And this is a typical no-go theorem. Okay. <clears throat> and in many models uh, with nice symmetry, uh, unique gap, unique ground state automatically satisfies this. And in this, if this is valid, then this condition here, th this expectation value is simply S, swing quantum number. So this condition reduces to this, S is half an integer. And so in this class of models, the model satisfying this and this, uh, this theorem reduces to this famous affleck leaf theorem, which says that if S is an half odd integer, there can be no unique gapped ground state. And this theorem is famous and important because it is closely related to uh, something called the Haldane conjecture, which brought Haldane the 2016 Nobel Prize in physics. And what does it say? Well, Haldane argued in 1981-1983 papers that the Heisenberg antiferromagnetic chain has, has a unique gapless ground state if S is a half odd integer and a unique gap ground state if S is an integer. Okay, So uh, this is quite relevant to this Haldane conjecture. Actually, it's, a, it's, it's relevant to this first half of Haldane conjecture. Okay, from now on, I, I want to concentrate on spin one chain. And first I want to discuss topological phase transition in spin one chains. So we have seen that when S is a half on integer, there can be no unique gap ground state in a certain class of models. But if S is an integer like one, then of course there are quantum spin chains with U1 and translation invariant Hamiltonians, which have a unique gapped ground state. Here are two examples. The first example is called the trivial model, and it's really trivial. This is a Hamiltonian. It's simply the sum of local SZ operators. Okay. And in this case, the ground state is simply the tensor product of zero ket. Zero ket is this eigenket of SZ operator. And uh, I note that this Hamiltonian is invariant, first of all, under any rotation about the z-axis, so it has U1 invariance, but it's also invariant under this spin flip of SZ operator. This is realized, for example, by the pi rotation about the x-axis. So it's a non-interacting model with U1 cross Z2 symmetry. Okay. The second example is called the AKLT model, and uh, Actually, I did this with Ian Affleck, Tom Kennedy, and Elliot Lee back in 1987. Uh, the uniqueness for the infinite chain was proved by Matsui. And this is the Hamiltonian. And we have an exact expression for the ground state. I'm not going to explain, but this is our, our graphic expression for the exact ground state. And you know that this has a unique gap ground state. And so this is a less trivial interacting antiferromagnetic model with larger SU2 symmetry. And so this is closely, closely related to the Haldane conjecture. So we have two examples of models with a unique gap ground state. How are they related? Are they something similar or are they very, very different? Uh, in order to answer this question, it's a good idea to look at a model which interpolates between these two Hamiltonians. So this S is the interpolating parameter and lowercase s is a parameter. And when lowercase s is zero, this is simply the trivial Hamiltonian. And when lowercase s is one, this is a KLT Hamiltonian. So we already know that at, at the two ends, zero and one, this has a unique gap ground state. What happens in between? This is a numerical simulation. Uh, this was done by my friend Hoshio Katsura, and he says uh, it was easy. He used Mathematica. And, okay, but anyway, uh, probably it's easy for him. I cannot do it. But uh, here you see this gap for this trivial Hamiltonian. And here you see the gap for the AKLT model, AKLT model, which should be identified with the Haldane gap. Okay. And you clearly see that in between there is a gapless point. So it's reasonable to conclude that there is a phase transition at an intermediate S. Let's draw a phase diagram. 
So uh, this is a critical point. And here we have trivial model. So probably we should call this the trivial phase. And here we have the held end gap. So we should call this the held end phase. What are the characters of the two phases? Well, in the trivial phase, we have a unique gap ground state, no symmetry, break, no symmetry breaking, no long range order. In the held end gap phase, held end phase, we have a unique gap ground state, no symmetry breaking, no long range order. So the same. So we should ask, how can we distinguish between these two phases? Or we should even ask whether there is a really phase transition between these phases. <clears throat> uh, this turned out to be a very good problem to think about. And many people, including myself, have thought about this. And there appeared some very nice ideas, hidden antiferromagnetic order. I'm not going to talk about this. And the emergence of edge state, I will come back to this later. And by combining these two, uh, Tom Kennedy and myself proposed a picture that we call the hidden z 2 groups Z2 symmetry breaking picture. And uh, th this turned out, this looked like a good picture. And once we thought this was the final answer, but uh, then we realized that it was not the final answer. But anyway, uh, I left, I sort of left the field after finishing this long paper with Tom Kennedy. And after some time, Gu, Wen, Paul, Monterno, Belk, and Oshikawa developed the theory of symmetry protected topological phases. And now we know that this is the final answer. We understand that this phase transition should be regarded as a transition between two symmetry protected topological phases. I will explain this later <clears throat> briefly. Okay, but rather interestingly, even at this point, there was no rigorous proof that there was a phase transition in this particular model. Uh, we tried to provide a proof, but we were not able to do that. And I sort of came back to this field, and one of the first things that I did was to provide a provide a rigorous proof of the existence of proof in this uh, particular model. So uh, I was happy about this, but anyway, it took a long time. So I was like this when I started thinking about this, and of course I was doing something else, but anyway, <clears throat> I was like this when I finished the proof, but this is already a long time, some years ago. This was before the pandemic. Okay, so, but this is not yet the end of the story. Uh, 2018 was a good year for mathematical physics of symmetry protected topological phases. But that was not because of my proof. That was because <clears throat> Yoshiko Ogata uh, developed the general, almost complete theory of symmetry protected topological phases this year. And then she moved on to two dimensional models. And, and now she has a very, almost complete theory in one and two dimensions. But anyway, uh, in one dimension, uh, I will come back, I will explain later, but her theory is much more complete than mine. So actually I liked my result and I gave a talk, I gave a talk about this like twice, but then Yoshiko's result came out and I stopped talking about, about this result. But in this conference, I gave a talk, but I talked about this result for the third time. So let me continue and talk about this. So the question was, how can you distinguish between these two phases? Well, one answer is to make use of this twist operator here. So this is our variation number two. Okay. And the observation made by Nakamura Todo is that you look at the expectation value of the twist operator and in the trivial state, uh, the expectation value is one. That's quite easy. It's all zero state. And this is less trivial, but if you compute in the AKLT state, the expectation value of this twist operator is almost minus one. So this means that this expectation value can be used as an order parameter. And actually they use this in a numerical simulation to distinguish between these two phases. Okay, so my observation was that this can be used for the definition of a topological index and for a rigorous proof. Okay, so this is our Hamiltonian, S is a parameter. And uh, I, point, I note that this HS is, of course, U1 invariant, but it's also invariant under this spin flip. So this has a U1 cross Z2 symmetry for any value of S. And if you apply this spin flip transformation to the twist operator, then this twist operator S turns to minus one. So this twist operator becomes U dagger. 
Now, suppose that omega s is a unique gap constant. The uniqueness implies this invariance, right? Of course, omega s must be invariant under this transformation, so uh, it must satisfy this. But then this means that this expectation value is real. So I, I said that this expectation value uh, must take value in this ring-shaped region in the complex plane, but now we further know that it must be real. So now it's now we see that this expectation value is very close to plus one or very close to minus one. This can be used to define a topological index. You know? So if, if, if it is close to plus one, we, we say that the index is one. If it is close to, if this is close to minus one, we say that the index is minus one. And you can compute this index for when s equals zero and one, and we see that they take different values. From this, <clears throat> I can prove this rigorously. There is an intermediate s, at which this ground state omega s is either not a unique gap ground state or exhibits discontinuity. And here's the proof. And this is very short, but this is almost a complete proof. So you suppose that there is no phase transition. That means uh, that that means for any s, omega s is a unique gap ground state, and this is continuous in s for any local operator a. Okay, but uh, we have, we have, so from this, we know that this omega, from this gap, gapness, unique gapness, we know that this omega SU is almost either almost plus or minus one, and for, for sufficiently large L, and we also know that this is continuous from this assumption. Then this cannot, of course, change its sign. So sigma S cannot change the sign, but, but uh, we know that sigma zero and sigma one are different. So there is a contradiction. Okay. So this is almost a complete proof, very short and simple, and I like it. And it's based on this consideration about twist operator. But as I said, uh, Ogata's result in the same year is a complete theory of SPT phases that only requires a minimum symmetry. In this case, Z2 cross Z2 symmetry. I will explain this later. And my theorem is elementary, very easy. And the Yoshiko theorem uh, requires very difficult mathematics like one by one algebra. But uh, mine is much elementary, but requires larger symmetry. In this case, U1 cross Z2 symmetry. So uh, in this sense, my theorem is physically weaker than Yoshiko's theorem. That's why I stopped talking about this. But anyway, this is the result. And this is based on the twist operator. And if you're interested in symmetry protected topological phases, uh, I will briefly talk about this in this lecture. But uh, there are, there is my three part lecture devoted to this uh, particular topic of symmetry protected topological phases. Uh, so if you're interested in, please uh, look at, please take a look at this lecture, which you can find on YouTube or in the list of my online lectures. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now I move on to the next topic of edge states, and I want to characterize the Haldane phase in this as spin one chains. Okay, let me go back to the AKLT model. So as I said, this model, AKLT model on the infinite chain has a unique gapped ground state. But if you consider the same model on the half infinite chain, then it is known that the model has doubly degenerate ground states, two ground states. And it is known that this double degeneracy comes from something called emergent effective spin one half degree of freedom at the edge. Okay. And we found this in the AKLT model, or exactly solvable, solvable model, and we first thought that this was a very special property of our model. But then soon after this, Tom Kennedy through numerical experiment uh, pointed out that this emergence of effective spin one half at the edge is a universal property of the Haldane phase. And then there appeared a beautiful experiment by Hagiura Katsumata, Fleck, Halper, and Renard uh, in which this effective spin one half at the edge was observed through ESR experiment. Of course, uh, you cannot have simply uh, chain with edge. So here you have 
they, they have a material called NEMP, N-E-N-P, and they dope impurity to this NEMP. And then impurity effectively uh, generates this kind of edge in many places. And then you clearly see this uh, signal of emergent spin one half degrees of freedom from the ESR experiment. Okay. So this is a very important property and I wanted to prove this. And actually I found that it was not easy. Okay, I realized this last year, uh, but so here is my statement. Okay, so this is our <clears throat> Hamiltonian, interpolating Hamiltonian that we have been talking about. And I rewrite this in terms of local operator like this. So this is a local interpolating Hamiltonian. This is the AKLT part, this is trivial part, okay. Then uh, this H prime S is the same Hamiltonian restricted onto the half infinite chain. Half infinite chain. And then here's the theorem. You assume that this HS has a unique gap ground state with sigma s the index minus one. So it means that it's in the Haldane phase. And then uh, I let omega prime s be an arbitrary ground state of H prime s. I do not assume anything like uniqueness. We don't know anything about this. Then uh, what we can prove is that for arbitrary given positive epsilon, there exists a local unitary operator u epsilon such that uh, this is this expectation value is zero and this expectation value is bounded from a by, by epsilon, and this is local and acts near the edge of z plus. Okay, and what does this mean? Well, if you rewrite this in usual language, you find that this means that this u prime u phi prime is orthogonal to the ground state of half infinite chain and its excitation energy is less than equal to epsilon, okay? So this is precisely the uh, low-lying, low-energy mode that lives near the edge, okay? This, is, this proves the existence of edge mode. How do you prove this? Well, the proof is very easy and this, yeah, looks okay. So this is my variation number four of this twist operator. So again, the proof uses twist operator, and this, this is just pictures, but this is a completely rigorous proof, okay. Now I fix L to be sufficiently large, and I want to examine this expectation value omega prime uh, U XL. And first of all, if X is sufficiently large, then the twist operator is like this, and this twist region is deep inside the bulk. And in this case, uh, since it is deep in bulk, uh, the uniqueness of the bulk ground state implies that this should be close to this. And we assume that uh, the bulk system in the Haldane phase, so this is close to minus one. So this is also close to minus one. That's number one. Uh, I fix same x, uh, same l, and <clears throat> makes x very negative and ne make x negative and satisfy this. And in this case, the twist region is here in this negative region. And so it, it actually, it doesn't do anything. It's just one. So in this case, the expectation value is one. Now we know that this omega prime u x l is continuous in x. So from the continu continuity, we find, and it's one here, it's minus one here. So by continuity, we conclude that there must be an intermediate x at which this is zero. So we have this for this particular x, and this is just the Lipschitz matis lemma, which is all, always valid. Okay. So uh, from this, I can conclude rigorously that there is an excited state with the excitation energy, energy bounded from above by C over L. Good. And one thing I like about this proof is that this logic here is exactly the same as the original logic used by Lipschitz Mattis in their 1961 paper. But in their case, they used this logic to show that the uh, spin one half Heisenberg antiferromagnetic chain has low lying excitations. So here I'm using the same logic to conclude that spin one chain with edge spin one chain on the half infinite half infinite chain has low, en low energy excitation near the edge. Okay. So that is the proof. <clears throat> okay, so the next topic is connecting HAKLT, AKLT model and the trivial model without phase transitions. 
But didn't, didn't I say that there is a phase transition between these two models? Well, I said, and it's true. So I already said that there is a phase transition between here. But here is a more general picture of symmetry protected topological phases. Okay? I said that, that there is a phase transition for this particular model. Okay? But the more general picture says that there always is a phase transition if uh, <clears throat> this H0 and this is H1. H0, H1, and Hs, everything has Z2 cross Z2 symmetry. Under this condition, then uh, they concluded, and actually Yoshiko got approved, that there is a phase transition in between. And this Z2 cross Z2 symmetry is the symmetry uh, with respect to the pi rotations about the x-axis and, and the z-axis, okay. This in turn means that one may connect the two models, two models here, zero and one, without phase transition if the symmetry is not respected. Okay. And actually this fact was already demonstrated back in 2012 by Sven Bachmann and Bruno Nachtelgel by a construction of very clever examples. And it was also proved within the theory of matrix product state by Yoshiko Ogata. And actually Daisuke Maekawa and myself also provided a simple example of this kind. So let me talk about this because uh, this is my variation number five. Okay. So my goal is to connect the ground state of this trivial Hamiltonian and the AKLT Hamiltonian. Here I consider the <clears throat> spin chain on finite open chain. Okay. And here is the exact ground state of the AKLT model. And I'm not going to explain, but this up down are the states of spin one half. And this S or this circle, this oval represents the projection onto the spin one state. Okay. Um, but anyway, you don't, and, and this, this state represents uh, the exact ground state with edge state here and here. Okay. But you don't have to care about this. Our uh, important one is this operator here. Uh, here I have Lipschutz Mattis like twist operator, but look, this is not a typo. I don't have I here. And theta is real. So this means that this is a very weird operator. It's a, it should be interpreted as a twist operator with imaginary rotation angle. Okay. And usually if you apply this kind of state to a translation invariant state, you get a very pathological non-translation invariant state. But <clears throat> In this particular case of AKLT state, uh, <clears throat> the result of application of this VS, imaginary angle twist operator, is more or less uh, basically rotation invariant, no, no, translation invariant state like this. Okay. <clears throat> Let me move it here. And then uh, this is the twisted state. And of course, when S equal one, this is the same as the AKLT model, which is the starting AKLT state which is the starting point. And when S equals zero, <clears throat> you see that this part vanishes. And actually this becomes up to a phase factor, uh, the product of all zero state. So this is a unique ground state of trivial state. So in this way, by using this VS operator, <clears throat> I could connect the ground state of the AKLT model and the ground state of this trivial model. You can go further to consider the infinite volume limit on the infinite chain. Uh, which I denote by omega tilde s. And by making use of the theory of matrix product states, I can show the following. I can say, show that there is a continuous family a tilde s with s running between zero and one of Hamiltonians on the infinite chain and which interpolates between AKLT Hamiltonian and trivial Hamiltonian. And also it has omega tilde s as its unique gap ground state. Okay. And of course, this Hamiltonian or these states do not uh, preserve this Z2 cross Z2 symmetry. That is the point. <clears throat> so this is a <clears throat> rough picture of this symmetry protected phases, these symmetry protected topological phases. So here is the AKLT Hamiltonian, here is the trivial Hamiltonian. And suppose that this three dimensional space is the whole space of short range Hamiltonians. And this plane here is the space of Hamiltonians with Z2 cross Z2 symmetries, symmetry. Okay, so <clears throat> if, you, if we are restricted onto this plane of 
Z2 cross Z2 symmetric models, then if you want to go from AKLT to trivial, you must always go through this circle, which consists of gapless models. So you always, whatever you do, you have to cross this. So there is a phase transition. And that was proved by Yoshiko Gata. And but if you we consider larger space of Hamiltonians without symmetry, then you can go from here to here, go to here to here, and go from here to here without going through a phase transition. Okay. So in this sense, uh, this region and this region in this plane is are called symmetry protected topological phases. You need symmetry to have the notion of uh, notion of phases. If you have symmetry, you have the notion of you have precise notion of phases. And without symmetry, you don't have the notion of phases. Okay, so the next topic is soundless spin pumping and spin one chains. But this is actually related to what I was talking about. And so this is a transformation that brings this ground state of AKLT model to this O0 state, okay, your R edge state. Now let's apply the reverse transformation, but with left and right reflected. And then you end up in this, again, the ground state of AKLT Hamiltonian, but different edge state. And you see that this up moved here. And so in this case, you see that S z equal plus one is pumped from left to right. And recall that we have U1 symmetry. So this total SZ is a conserved quantity. So we can regard this SZJ as a local charge operator. Then this corresponds, precisely corresponds to a process known as Thaulus charge pumping, okay? And I want to argue that this is a rather general phenomenon. For this purpose, I discuss general theory of pumping an infinite quantum spin chain, okay? And consider a general <clears throat> Hamiltonian HPS, P stands for pumping, uh, parameterized by S, which runs between zero and one. So here, very standard assumption. Uh, this is U1 invariant, cyclic, and unique. it has unique gap ground state. And this depends continuously in S for any local U, A. And since this is variation number six, I again consider, of course, the twist operator. And here I fix X and also fix L, which is sufficiently large. And consider this expectation value, which is of course very close to one and it takes complex value and it's continuous in S. So this expectation value defines a closed loop within this ring shaped region. So you have well-defined winding number, which I denote by P. And the claim is, that this winding number P is nothing but the amount of SZ pumped from left to right in the ground state when S is adiabatically changed from zero to one. And I think this fact is rather well known to physicists. And how rigorous is this? Well, I can prove, I can justify this claim rigorously under some uh, strong assumption about finite volume ground states. And this assumption is valid for my previous example. Okay, so that is the situation, okay? <clears throat> and now I consider, I go back to SPT phases and consider something I called half spin pumping. So these are basically the same assumptions, but now S runs between zero and one half. And here are extra, extra assumptions. I assume that, uh, I only assume the one invariance, but I here assume that H, H, HP zero and HP one half have larger U1 cross Z2 symmetry, okay? So it means that it, it is also invariant under this spin flip. And now you can talk about symmetry protected topological phases. And I assume that at S equal zero, this is in Haldane phase and at S equal one half, this is in trivial phase. So these are indices. And this means that this expectation value takes this kind of, of course they are both real and this is close to minus one and this is close to one. So this is a picture. You start from here, you, you end here. So in this case, winding number must take value, which is integer plus one half. I don't know what this winding number is, but I'm sure that it cannot be zero. Okay, it's at least one half or minus one half, three half or whatever, three halves or whatever, but it cannot be zero. Okay, 
this is the basic observation. So if you go from zero to one half, you must go, go around this at least half. And then the rest is easy. Uh, you, you just let it go and make a complete circle. And of course, uh, if you do it stu in a stupid, stupid manner, it just goes around. It does not uh, have any winding number, but you know you can force it to go around. And it's just easy. And this is one way of doing it. So now uh, S runs between zero and one. And these are the, everything is almost the same. And this is one extra assumption about the, uh, the reflection. So this R denotes a spatial reflection, bond-centered or site-centered, which, uh, <coughs> whichever you like. And I assume this symmetry. I impose this symmetry. Then uh, this assures that it, it, it has to go keep on going and have non-zero winding number. So here's the theorem. In the above setting, the winding number P is non-zero. And and what you know, uh, I note that this winding number is always well defined. Uh, whether we can interpret it as the pumped spin, but anyway, uh, the interpretation is that this p, of course, the winding number is the amount of total spin pumped in the adiabatic process. Okay, so <clears throat> this is my variation number seven, and <clears throat> this is the physical interpretation. So we always have non-zero pumping when there is a path of Hamiltonians with a unique gap ground state, which connect models in the Haldane phase and the trivial phase. So if you can go from here to here without phase transition uh, by <clears throat> using these U1 symmetric Hamiltonians, then you can make use of this to construct this kind of path in which we always have non-zero spin pumping. And <clears throat> as far as as far as I know, this kind of picture was first pointed out by Kuno and Hatsugai, and this is one rigorous and general version of their observation. And I, I demonstrated everything in spin one chain, uh, but I can construct similar example of, of translation invariant models with any integer spin s. Okay. And the final topic is uh, this is basically the same thing, but it's about the classification, classification of loops of Hamiltonians. Let me first discuss uh, index for a loop of Hamiltonians, but this is nothing new. This is the same as pumping business, but only new notation. So by H dot, I denote a loop of Hamiltonians. Uh, this is simply one parameter family HS, where S runs between zero and one, and one of you and invariant Hamiltonians. And I assume that it defines a cycle like this. And here are the same assumptions. And again, then uh, this expectation value, if, when, if, if I fix X and L and change S from zero to one, then we, we get this uh, loop in this ring shape region. So we have this winding number PH, okay? So this is a theorem, but this is something we already know, okay? And this index, has a nice invariance property. Okay, uh, this is again very trivial. But uh, I say take take two loops h dot and h prime dot of Hamiltonians, and we say that they are homotopic with each other if and only if there exists an interpolating Hamiltonian h tilde, parameterized by s and lambda, and this coincides with h s when lambda equals zero, and coincides with h prime s when lambda equals one. And I further assume this unique gap condition for this and this continuity condition for this. And so this is just, just a picture of two loops. And then uh, it is rather trivial by continuity that if, if these two loops of Hamiltonians are homotopic with each other and their indices are the same, okay? And in this recent paper, this is a difficult paper, but you find a much more general and complete version of this kind of state. Okay, anyway, so uh, this is trivially easy, and this is my variation number eight. And as a trivial consequence of this uh, theorem, I point out the, the, that we can show a somewhat interesting non go theorem. So recall this situation. So we have this line of U1 cross T2 symmetric models, and on this line, we have trivial phase and Haldane phase. And we have shown that there is a transition. We, we still do not have shown that it's a 
gapless model. People believe that it's a gapless model, but anyway, we have shown that there is something singular in between. And here's the larger picture of U1 symmetric models with unique gap ground state. And I could we could co connect this Haldane phase to a trivial phase by only using this U1 symmetric model uh, with unique gap ground state. And then uh, we can complete this path to make this loop here. And this has non non-zero winding number or non-zero spin pumping. So we have this loop with non-zero spin pumping, non-zero winding number, and inside we have this singularity. And I would say that this structure is stable in the following sense. Okay, take a two-dimensional disk and consider a map from this disk to your one symmetric Hamiltonians. And I assume that at this boundary, this map coincides with this pumping Hamiltonian which have non-zero winding number. And then uh, since this is not homotopic to a trivial loop that consists of a single Hamiltonian, uh, you can conclude that there must be something singular in between here. You, know, you cannot have the situation that it's, it's here, it's a no-go theorem. So the, the basic, the main, precise statement is that, okay, D, D, D is a disk and HQ, is this is a map from disk to U1 invariant Hamiltonians, okay? And it coincides with this pumping Hamiltonian at the boundary. Then it is impossible that HQ has a unique gap ground state omega Q for all Q in the disk. And also that this omega Q A is continuous in Q for any local operator A. So uh, this means that there must be some singularity. It could be gapless Hamiltonian, degenerate Hamiltonian, discontinuous ground state, or whatever. But anyway, we, we are sure that there is a there is some singularity. So uh, this is somewhat interesting. So we started from this consideration of SPT phases. So we needed this U1 cross D2 symmetry to locate this phase transition. But here, uh, of course, we have U1 cross D2 symmetry here and here, but except we don't assume this, we only assume U1 symmetry, but still this singularity sort of survives and it must be always here. Okay, so these are my variations. So I can go to my summary. <clears throat> so the basic message is that the twist operator of Leap, Schultz, Mattis and Affleck Leap enables us to prove various topological properties of quantum spin chains in, I would say, surprisingly elementary manners. And you know, these were, the proofs were very, very short and elementary. And uh, here's about the extension. This method actually applies to fermions or bosons in a quantum particle system in one dimension. And actually this extension is more natural because uh, recall that we had to assume U1 symmetry, but in quantum spin systems, there are many systems without U1 symmetry, but in particle system, with particle number conservation, we have uh, quantum mechanical U1 symmetry, built in U1 symmetry, and we can use this symmetry uh, to make this argument, okay? And th this is the question I'm asking to myself. Uh, so th this was very elementary. So are there similar elementary strategies that apply to systems with like Z2 cross D2 symmetry and avoid using difficult von Neumann algebra that, that Yoshiko Gata used? Uh, but for the moment, it seems very, very difficult. Okay, so that's basically all I wanted to say, but let me uh, make a few comments about references. So first of all, if you are interested in background, basic and other interesting topics, related topics, I recommend you my book, which was published in 2020. And this is a book, so it's, it's beautiful. So it, actually the cover was designed by Japanese renowned manga artist, Mari Okazaki, and well, so it's worth having in your bookshelf, okay? And here is, I also, I already talked about this, but this is a, a pedagogical review. And this is my, actually my contribution to very recently published uh, two volume uh, books, uh, which is dedicated to Elliot Leap, the physics and mathematics of Elliot Leap. And anyway, in this uh, review article, I discussed the, uh, uh, formulation of infinite spin systems, so especially spin system on infinite chains. And I also uh, discussed generalized 
Lipschitz Mattis, and also extended Lipschitz Mattis theorem, which I did not talk about in this uh, webinar. And uh, here are my papers, related papers, and for, as for G2 index for SP and for SPT phase transitions, uh, this is for quantum spin chains, and this is for particle systems. And actually, the idea of uh, the existence of proof, existence proof of edge state appears in this paper. And the pumping state that connects the trivial and AKLT model appears in this uh, recent paper. The main topic is slightly different. And uh, as for pump, pumping and all these stuffs, I still have to write something. Okay, so thank you very much for watching and goodbye.